Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 10th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we are concerned that the Department of Revenue's oil and gas tax component is becoming politicized under Commissioner Adam Crum. Second, we discuss where we think Alaska Policy Forum has gone badly wrong in its assessment of this year's state budget. And third, we explain how an already challenging Cook Inlet energy situation could become even worse. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's talk a little bit here about um, what, uh, you know, the weekly top three and what's going on. First and foremost, there's a story in the Alaska landmine that talks about uh, the director of uh, the DOR, the Department of Revenue, um, how the tax director of tax uh, had just apparently quietly been fired. And you're asking the question about the politicization of the Department of Revenue. Is that happening and what does it mean? And is there evidence of something else going on? Uh, give us your take on this. Well, Michael, there's three positions in the Department of Revenue that are important the commission, uh, for oil and gas tax purposes. You know, our largest revenue source uh, uh, under current law, if you uh, would adhere to the PFD statute, oil and gas taxes are still our start, start largest revenue sources. Three important positions. The commissioner, obviously, the deputy director to whom the 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 direct uh, the tax or deputy commissioner to whom the tax director typically reports um and the tax director and those are the three key players now their role is to administer the statutes to administer the laws passed by the legislature so we're not talking about we're not talking about changing the law here we're talking about the roles that administer the statutes and in my experience and i'm sure a number of people who have dealt with uh, oil and gas in the state, uh, that administration can has a lot of flexibility. It can be fairly tight. It can be fairly broad. It can it can uh, uh, really uh, affect how much of the revenue is being collected. Since Adam Crum has been uh, named uh, commissioner of the Department of Revenue, the deputy director has departed. Uh, Brian Fector uh, uh, left under circumstances that weren't entirely clear. And now last week or two weeks ago, uh, the tax director, Colleen Glover, who had been there since the beginning of the Dunleavy administration, uh, was, according to the landmine report, fired. Um, and that's not good. I mean, I've dealt with both Brian and I've dealt with Colleen. They're very professional. They are solid people. Uh, Colleen is a, it, it has been there since you know four or five years since the beginning of the Dunleavy administration. Very straightforward. I mean, basically, what the job is is to call balls and strikes. Did you comply with the statute? Did you not comply with the statute? And and it's important to have somebody in those roles who are ex, who's experienced and who is a good, solid. Uh, 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 umpire, referee that, that's calling balls and strikes. The, the concern that I have is, is that Adam is replacing these people because they're not uh, as friendly as he wants to the industry. Uh, uh, Brian had run in with the industry about a, uh, some of the industry about a couple of issues 
uh, as he was, uh, he's sort of the appeal process that tax makes a decision or tax director makes a decision, appeals up to the de deputy director. He had a run in with the industry on a couple of issues. Colleen has had a run in with the industry on a couple of issues. Colleen's background was at Alieska, so it's not like she's not, it's not like she's coming in from out of left field or come in, coming in from uh, uh, some position where you, you know, anti-industry position. She was with Alieska. And she's had a couple of run-ins with industry. And and those run-ins have now been followed uh, since Adam has been commissioner with uh, with uh, their the departure of those two individuals. Adam has political aspirations. I mean, you... you well, I mean, it wasn't this guy. He was just with the Department of... Uh, was he health and social services commissioner? I mean, right, he was just, right. I mean, what, what is his qualifications for, for being, I don't know if you have to have qualifications for being DOR commissioner, but it seems like he's hopping around the administration a bit. Well, and you, you may recall he ran against Shelly Hughes for state Senator, uh, when, uh, Shelly was uh, first elected to that spot. So Adam right. has, Adam's relatively young and has continuing political aspirations and has been known to have good friends in the industry, which oil industry, which is not, I mean, that's a, not a disqualifier, but when you, when you couple that with, with Brian's departure uh, after a couple of run-ins with industry and now Colleen's departure after a couple of run-ins with industry, I begin to wonder, uh, I'm beginning to get concerned that, that uh, potentially what we have here uh, is uh, is Adam uh, 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 currying favor with his industry friends uh, in anticipation of a run for you know crumb for governor in uh, in in 20, 2026 or crumb for you know house or something and 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 industry backing would be important in a political campaign like that you'd want to position yourself to have industry backing and I'm a little concerned that what's going on here is is we're beginning to tilt. The Department of Revenue, the administration side of the Department of Revenue, critical pieces in the administration of the oil and gas tax code, we're beginning to tilt it uh, away from calling balls and strikes and beginning to tilt it into a into a more uh, favorable uh, 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 operation for uh, for industry. So it's something I, I Landfield's got it uh, got it identified in this week's uh, in a, in a column. Uh, in his in his Sunday uh, land landmine column, uh, he also has a column from last Friday, I think, that talks about Colleen's departure. Um, it's not something that's been picked up by the rest of the press, but it's something that I think we should be concerned about, and something that, frankly, I'm going to follow fairly closely from here on in. Because again, as you said, these are the ones that decide whether or not the producers are in compliance with state law. And that is where the revenue for the state is coming in. And if they cozy up too much to the uh, producers, then obviously our revenue goes down. They're able to, they have some, they have some discretion. And as you said, flexibility and discretion in, in the enforcement of the law, and they can decide whether or not it's feasible um, and, uh, although you've been accused of being a guy who doesn't care about, uh, you know, the taxes and oil and gas and stuff coming out, you do very much. I mean, you believe that, uh, as I've said before, you believe that there's still money on the table that we could address the tax law and actually get a little more, but it doesn't help if we pass the law and the people who are enforcing it are super friendly in the pockets of the oil industry, because then they just say, oh yeah, sure. You don't have to pay that. I mean, they have the authority to actually do that kind of stuff. Well, it, I mean, no law is perfect. You, you, no law is is absolutely perfect for every situation, and so you have situations come up where you know you have uh, you have an interpretation of the law that's that's due, and there's interpretations that are you know more consistent with the law, less consistent with the law, but still within the boundary of what the what the law would provide. And that's and that's why you have a tax director. Uh, that's the person to whom the auditors ultimately report. Uh, that's why you have a deputy director, uh, deputy commissioner, uh, to uh, to administer those those sorts of things and to call balls and strikes. And when industry takes a position and says, "Ooh, the statute really means this," to say, "No, the statute doesn't mean that." From the state standpoint, the statute means this, and that's how we're going to administer the statute. If you don't believe, if you don't agree with this, go to court or go to the go to uh, the ALJs, uh, the administrative law judges. But but this is this is the position we're taking, and it's those people, the ones 
that that will say this is the position we're taking. If you don't if you don't agree with this, take us to court. Uh, uh, those are the people that we're talking about here: uh, the deputy commissioner right. and the and the tax director. So this you know, is- if, if and if they say if they say, you know, if, if industry says, well, you know, you can interpret the statute this way. And if the tax director and the deputy commissioner say, well, okay, you know, we'll, we'll interpret it that way, you can lose, you can lose revenue. And Michael, let, let's think about who that revenue is coming out of the pocket of. The way we're going, you know, PFD cuts is the marginal source of revenue. So what we're talking about is, is creating an opportunity for additional PFD cuts, additional revenue coming out of the pockets of Alaska families, middle and lower income Alaska families, and sliding over the, to the industry through uh, through this sort of looser administration. This raises a bigger question, obviously. Uh, This is all happening on Dunleavy's watch. Does that mean that he is, uh, I guess at this point, all in on, uh, uh, on the industry, you know, being pro industry? Is he, is, is, does he have a, he has some responsibility in what's going on here, I'm assuming, because he has to sign off on it, I would imagine at some point. Well, these are probably decisions that are within the commissioner's uh, realm. Who uh, who fills the deputy commissioner slot probably does go to the governor. Uh, who fills the tax director slot? I'm not as certain would go to the governor. Uh, certainly, the governor can intervene and ask uh, and ask the commissioner what's going on. But I'm not I'm not I'm not comfortable saying that that these are coming at the direction of the governor. I mean, Colleen was there for four years, did a great job for four years. All of a sudden, in the first year of Adams' administration, she's not doing a great job. And 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 she's terminated. Brian was in OMB for a long period of time before he came over uh, to uh, Department of Natural. Before he came over to Department of Revenue, um, <laughs> did a great job at OMB. Came over and was doing a great job at DOR. Adam comes on the scene and Brian's come on. So it's this is not. I you know if 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 it was Dunleavy. I would I would think they would have been gone before. This is this is more attributable to Adam Crum coming in and becoming commissioner. And so you think this is more about currying favor for future electoral aspirations than it is for protecting the state and protecting the revenue and getting the max resource that uh, you know, which is the job of the DOR is to maximize the resource uh, revenue from the state. That's the concern I have. We've never had really a revenue commissioner who's had continued uh, political aspirations. We've never had a revenue commissioner who sat there and, you know, make sure his name stays out as a candidate for for future situations. We've never had a revenue commissioner who's who's, you know, been in the mix for running for governor when uh, when the current governor's term uh, expires. We, we've never really had, the revenue commissioner has always been more a professional bureaucrat. I don't, I, 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 I dare say more somebody who's interested in the position and doing the job there than he is, you know, positioning he or she positioning for future political office. Adam is unique uh, in, in that, in that regard. He's young enough and he's ambitious enough and he's, and he's position and he's get, making sure his name's staying out there in a way that is different for the Department of Revenue. So you you take that and you add in getting rid of Brian and Colleen, um, uh, both of whom have had run-ins with the industry as any deputy, deputy commissioner and any tax division head are going to do. You want them to have those run-ins with industry because you want them to be making sure that they're looking out for the state's interests. When the, when the industry comes up with a crazy theory about why they don't owe taxes, you want a tax director and a deputy commissioner pushing back on that. So they've had run-ins, okay, um, but you know that they've had run-ins before. They had run-ins during Dunleavy's first term. It's when Adam comes came on board that uh, that this right. has become a problem. So yeah. uh, it's something something that we need to watch out for because this could, you, you know, if if you got if you got people who are bending over to help the industry inside the Department of Revenue, that can become a real problem. Yeah, put on your put on your your political analysis hat um crumb aspirations for office yada 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 but he was the commissioner of health and social services donna says he left a bit of a mess when he left there um uh when when he left hss 
but he oversaw a huge component of the um, COVID lockdowns and everything. I mean, do you think he has, he may have political aspirations, but that may have been damaging to him. I mean, at that point, what do you, I mean, what do you, what do you think? Is he, um, does he have a chance? I mean, I would not think that the logical jump would be from the commission to uh, the governor's race or even to a Senate race, maybe a house race, but I just don't see, you know, he may have aspirations, but that seems like that's quite a leap. Well, what we've done, what we've done with, with financing uh, is, is make this a money game. I mean, we, we, by removing the financing limits, uh, money is now a big part of whether you have, whether you have electability or not. Uh, and let's think in the state who has money. <laughs> Let's stay, let's think in the state who has who has uh, uh, enough money to to influence uh, the outcome of elections. Well, that'd be the oil industry, and and you know if you it, it, it's 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 it, if you were gonna try to curry favor with somebody, uh, the oil industry would be the one to do it with. Um, and and, it, and Michael, the test of of is Adam electable? Does Adam have issues? That, that could get in his way, I'm not sure that's the complete test. If he thinks he's electable, if he thinks he has a chance, he thinks he has a chance of getting elected, and he thinks the way to get there is uh, is by currying favor with the oil industry. And, you know, the oil industry is not going to stop it and say, oh, you right. have no chance. <laughs> no, go right. away. Don't, they'll don't still, ever bother yeah. us again. Yeah, they'll still throw money at it. If they think they can get uh, some quid pro quo back, they'll definitely throw money at it, whether he wins or not uh, at that point. Because uh, he could still, uh, you know, he could still help them off in the in the future. It's a little... And, 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 Go ahead. And I'm not saying there's a memo that says, from the oil industry that says, Adam, you get rid of these people, we'll back you. I, that's, not, that's not what's going on. This is much more subtle. This sure. is much more... I hang out with my friends. My friends are my friends in the oil industry. They're complaining about Brian. They're complaining about Colleen. They're complaining about this year, this issue or that issue. I like my friends. I want to be friends with my friends. I want my friends to support me. So what if I get rid of them and get people in that they don't complain about? Wouldn't that be better? Yeah. That's 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 what I'm concerned is going on here. Yeah. Well, I could definitely see that. And uh again, whether or not the governor has direct uh, has direct, uh, uh, well, he has direct influence on it, but whether or not he has direct culpability in what's going on is another thing. I mean, at some point he is ultimately responsible. If his commissioner is running amok, he should probably be asking the hard questions of what's going on here. Uh, unless of course he also doesn't mind the state getting a little cozier with the oil companies. I mean, that, you know, he may have aspirations for something larger. Maybe he can ride on that coattails. Who knows? Well, I'm sure he does have aspirations for something larger, but, but you don't, yeah, th this, boy, this wouldn't be the way to do it. Cause this can just blow up in your face. Here's, here's another issue about this. There was no discussion when Brian departed, Brian Fector departed the deputy commissioner's role. There was no discussion when Colleen departed. I mean, the, 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 what the landmine said is she was terminated. There was absolutely no notice of that, no discussion of it. Legislators said they weren't notified of it. Right. Um, so, so it's sort of, it's happening in the dark, right? And when things happen in the dark, you begin to wonder uh, what the motivation is and why they want to keep it in the dark or why they won't at least talk about it. So right. that's- I mean, this this happened with Colleen. This was like three weeks ago. I mean, you're finding out about everything after the fact that she's terminated. They haven't named it. The assistant, uh, the, the the deputy commissioner, they said has taken over, but he's still listed as a deputy, not acting, uh, you know, a director, yada, yada, yada. So, Tax director, right. Yeah. And so it seems like it's all very hush, hush, quiet, quiet on the QT. They're hoping nobody would notice kind of thing. Yeah. And, and again, Brian and industry or Brian and Colleen have both had run-ins with industry. So it's not like, it's not like, you know, something, something else was going on. It doesn't seem like something else was going on. It seems like industry was pushing back in Adam, Adam cave. So it's, um, it's a concern. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. That's number one of the weekly top three. Number two has to do with the idea of a quote unquote responsible government. And uh, 
It's a two-step. Give me a quick tease, and we'll jump to the break, Brad. Well, Alaska Policy Forum is is making a big deal. It's come out with an article last week and now coming out with some ads uh, that talk about uh, the FY24 being a responsible budget, you know, fitting within certain parameters that that uh, uh, that Alaska Policy Policy Forum sees uh, sees as responsible. There's really two tests for responsibility. One is does it balance? The second is who pays, and are you structuring who pays in a way that in, in, ensures that the economy is doing okay, is beneficial to the economy, uh, and is fair across the board. And Alaska Policy Forum spends a long time talking about the first absolute radio silence on the second, and I think that's a problem. Welcome back to the program, The Michael Duke Show. Brad Keithley is our guest. The weekly top three continues, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two, the Alaska Policy Forum, who I agree with in a lot of issues, did put out this uh, piece. Uh, talking about Alaska has a responsible government now. Yay. Um, but at the same time, talking in kind of platitudes about a uh, a broader, more f- uh, secure fiscal plan and everything else. Uh, they keep using that word responsible, though, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it means what you think it means kind of thing. Brad, you said there's a two-stage approach, and they're only addressing one stage. Right. There's two tests to whether a budget is responsible or reasonable or whatever, whatever phrase you want to use. One is, is a balance. Um, and, and the second is, how do you get it balanced? Who's paying uh, for, uh, uh, for, for government? And that test has, is important from not only the standpoint of fairness, that you want to make sure it's broad based, that nobody has to pay too much, but it's also important from the standpoint of economic impact. You want, you want a, a revenue base that is, that has a low impact uh, across the economy and 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 helps uh, helps uh, promote the economy or helps maintain the economy as opposed to you know unfairly penalizing uh, one piece of the economy or another. The uh, Alaska Policy Forum has come out with this this piece that says, "Oh, Alaska has a responsible budget." Uh, reminds me of what Dunleavy said in his um, in his veto statement that Alaska has a reasonable budget. Well. It, it does in the sense that it balances. It does in the sense that revenues equal uh, uh, equal uh, uh, spending. Uh, and, and, you know, we're not drawing down savings. We're not taxing future generations for one of the few times. But that's only the first test. The second test is how are you balancing it? Who's paying uh, the burden of, uh, of government costs? And this budget is far from responsible or far from reasonable uh, in connection with uh, with with who's paying. It's being paid in in large part through PFD cuts, which are as as Matt Berman from the ICER has told us uh, are uh, the most regressive taxes ever uh, that fall hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families. And as ICER told us in 2016, uh, in the 2016 ICER study, has the largest adverse impact. Uh, of any of the revenue options on uh, on Alaska families, and and so you can't say you can't say that that a budget is responsible and put the period there, or a budget is reasonable and put the period there, when the second test, the who's paying test, uh, is is so badly violated, is 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 so so badly missed. Think about it this way. Think about it if the budget was balanced through an income tax, through a progressive income tax that took huge amounts. From uh, from the top twenty percent in order to balance the budget, Alaska Policy Forum would be all over that. They'd be complaining about you know the undue burden on uh, on high income, how how anti uh, in, uh, how anti economy that is, how anti investment that is, how concerning that is in terms of population movement. Well, we've got a progr- we've got an income tax. It's just hugely regressive, uh, taking most of it from middle and lower income Alaska families. Increasingly regressive. As you go along, and that approach, that unbalanced approach, that that regressive uh, approach, that tilted approach, just like progressive is tilted upward, regressive is tilted backward. Uh, that regressive approach has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. So it's it's I think it's disingenuous uh, and borders on dishonest for Alaska Policy Forum to be you know touting that this budget is responsible and reasonable and. And 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 fits its criteria when the second test, when when whether who's paying and how it's balanced is such a such a mess right now. 
Well, I think it's interesting because a policy form ostensibly is about small or more limited government, and yet this budget does anything but that. It obviously gives more and more to government. It takes from the PFD and gives to government and does all those things. So while you're right, technically it falls within the boundaries of responsible because it lives within the expenditure versus revenue argument, it's also growing the size and scope of government. And you would think that they would not cheer that on, or at least there'd be a mention of it saying, well, it's good that we're responsible, but at the same time, we're growing government. They don't say anything about that in that article, which I found telling, if nothing else. Yeah, it's um, there's another agenda going on here by Policy Forum, and the, and the agenda is to sort of, you know, support the top 20 percent Republicans um, and and say, you know, government's good as long as it's balanced. However, that how, however, it's balanced is good as long as it's balanced. It sort of repeats the themes of the. <gasps> Uh, of the Alaska Senate sort of repeats the theme theme of some of the of the House Republicans sort of repeats the theme of the governor, but you can't say that. I mean, that's not that's not how you how you determine what a responsible, reasonable budget is. You've got to meet both both tests. You can say it's partly responsible. I mean, it's finally ba- it finally you know the, the 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 sums on both sides balance out, but you can't say. It's responsible, period, or it's reasonable, period, when you've got such a huge imbalance uh, in uh, in the who pays category and a, such a such an adverse impact uh, on the overall economy from the way in which the the revenues are being raised. Uh, it's interesting. Jeremy says unsustainable budgets are not balanced budgets, and there is an issue of sustainability when you talk about balancing a budget. Sure, if you want balance, you want to balance a budget one year but you know that you can't do that moving forward. Is it truly a balanced, responsible budget? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, sustainability has a lot of components also. One is, is the economy sustainable? Is, is, is the economy, does the economy grow under the kind of budget you've developed? I mean, that's one of, one of the concerns that we've had right. sustainable budgets since the very beginning. I mean, do, are you, are you developing your budget in a way that allows your economy to continue to grow, that doesn't impede the growth of the economy. And again, back to the 2016 ICER, ICER study, PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact of any of the revenue measures on the overall economy. So the answer, well, the answer is no. I mean, I, I, mean I, I think we've proved on this program that the, that the vast majority of movers and shakers in the state of Alaska don't really care about the private economy. They care primarily about the government spend and the public economy. And if that's okay, then they can go home and sleep at night and it's fine. It doesn't matter who else has to pay the price for that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, you think wouldn't we, think you would you wouldn't think policy forum would fall in that category, would you? But, I, you know, but they again, do. That was what was shocking to me because again, ostensibly their argument and their their whole premise is smaller, more reasonable, more sustainable governments. That's what they've talked about in other things and everything else, and being fiscally responsible and all that. And this just doesn't seem to fall in that category. A little bit, I think they've fallen into that classic trap of again. No taxes, the PFD's welfare kind of thing, which is, uh, I think, a problematic approach to say the least. Um, well, it's the top twenty. It's the, it's the top twenty percent approach. I mean, yeah. what they've what they what they've fallen into is the trap of saying the only people that count are the top twenty percent. The rest of you, eighty eh, percent, we don't care about you. Yeah. That's that's a that's a horrible place to be. Let's talk about number three, which of course is the Cook Inlet issue, uh, the gas. Uh, it's diminishing. They're talking about different alternatives. Uh, we could see an increase in the South Central area. Everybody who's on the gas system uh, in South Central could see an increase of up to a third in their costs. There's some other things they could import. They could do some things. But your whole point is don't exacerbate the problem by trying to subsidize it, Brad. We do have a problem. Uh, the Cook Inlet is, uh, in terms of gas reserves, producible gas reserves that we currently have, Behind pipe, um, uh, it's it's running lower. The deliver deliverability is running lower. We had this problem ten years ago. Before then, uh, we didn't have storage, and so when you when you needed more gas in Anchorage or needed more gas for electricity, you just turned the valve, turned up the production, or brought more wells on, brought increased production from from wells that you had turned down, uh, and met the demand. Ten years ago, we didn't have enough deliverability. That meet winter peak. So we built storage to store gas in the summer, store excess surplus gas in the summer, and then bring that out of storage like you would have a super well. 
bring that out of storage uh, in the winter to meet deliverability. Now we've got a problem that there's, even with the storage fields, there's not enough gas being produced to, to meet the winter peak uh, from a combination of the gas fields uh, and the storage. So that, that's, we've definitely got a problem. Uh, there are solutions to it. There's a, there's a study group that's been looking at it. Uh, they've outlined solutions of bringing in LNG in, a, in different ways. Uh, including uh, floating LNG, uh, floating uh, regas units, which is what Europe used when Russia cut off Europe. Germany put in a bunch of floating regas units, and that's how they've met their their demand. Well, another is reversing the Kenai, the old Kenai LNG facility, to bring gas in through the bring gas back in through the old Kenai LNG facility. And then they and then they've talked about a couple of pipe options. One is a bullet line. Uh, that would come down from the north, bring gas down from the north slope solely for Fairbanks and South Central. Uh, and the other is the big uh, LNG or the big uh, uh, gas line that we've always, that we've talked about forever uh, that would that would drop off gas in South Central and drop off gas in Fairbanks as part of uh, as a part of big uh, uh, the big uh, export uh, exportation uh, program. All of those have costs associated with them. I mean, if you if if we're going to run low or produce gas, all of them have costs. Building an LNG facility, even a floating LNG facility, is going to have cost to it. Building the line down, the, one of the two pipelines down from the North Slope is going to have cost to it. And now we've got people talking about, well, now we could. They're expensive, hugely expensive. They're going to dump dump a bunch of costs on South Central, uh, but we can uh, uh, we can subsidize those with state money. That's the last thing, absolute last thing we need to do. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, uh, the kind of the scramble and everything else. And of course, once South Central has a problem, then we might see solutions, uh, even though Fairbanks has been struggling for years, it'll be interesting to see what the solution is. I mean, I definitely have benefited for the last 10 years of living down here and ex experiencing cheap energy. Can we keep it up is the question. And do we need that subsidy? Uh, it's, uh, I think that's due for a broader discussion, Brad. I think we could have a broader discussion on that as well. And we will as this goes along, but I want to get it surfaced as an issue early on because I, the last thing we need is to get a big, you know, rolling support system for subsidies rolling into the next legislature. In an ideal world, we would have a line that could export. I mean, it seems like such a shame, Brad, that we're struggling for oil and gas when we've got 17 trillion cubic feet of gas on the North Slope. That seems to be, you know, the idea and the thought that we may have to import our own gas seems almost offensive at that point. I mean, the fact that we're sitting on so much and can't seem to do anything with it. Well, and that's what that's what some people are going to say. Some people are going to say we can't. This is what Sean Parnell said in 2013, the last, the last time we had a gas crisis. They're going to say, oh, no, Alaska is not going to import gas, period, end of statement. I don't care what we have to do. Alaska is not going to import gas. Well, last time that he made that statement, we spent a whole bunch of money in terms of tax credits to encourage uh, the Cook Inlet producers to go out, I mean, essentially subsidize them to go out and explore for uh, additional gas. And we did get additional gas supplies out of that, but it was at significant cost to the state treasury. Um, this time, we're going to have the same sort of reaction. Yes, we, uh, Alaska can't have imported gas into it. Well, it's economics. I mean, the economics are the big line. The big export line is hugely expensive. We can't find anybody in the globe yet. Uh, that wants to that wants to you know do the deal with us for uh, for gas from the huge export line, the bullet line just bringing gas down just solely to Fairbanks and, and South Central is even more expensive on a on a per unit basis, uh, uh, even more expensive than the, than the big line. So it's um, the economics are the economics are 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 bad to 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 find our own uh, find our own gas. Somebody's going to pay for it. I mean it's. If we do those and we subsidize them, again, what's the marginal source of revenue in the state? It's PFDs. We're going to be taking it out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families uh, to subsidize, uh, subsidize, you know, making life a little more tolerable for people in South Central. That's we have to follow the economics. The economics are likely going to lead us to LNG. Yeah, it's, it's odd that we got all this gas up north and we're going to be importing LNG, but that's what the economics say. That's what the that's what the dollars and cents say, and and we ought not to deviate. Well, we ought not to try to override that by saying, well, the state will just pump bump punch in a bunch of money 
uh, to try to uh, try to make it uh, lower cost. Well, thankfully, at the time Parnell was talking about all that, we had billions of dollars in savings, and now we're not at that point. So hopefully it's not as attractive as it was uh, during his heyday. Uh, where we had all this excess money, we're like, we could do stuff with this. Uh, hopefully, uh, cooler heads prevail on that, and uh, and we could do it because we don't have that kind of uh, uh, liquidity that we did back then. Well, where do we have that money, Michael? We have it. Uh, we have well, it in the permanent true. fund. It's true. I mean, and- there's billions of dollars in the permanent. I'm still hoping that they, you know, that they that all the cooler heads do prevail and nobody loses their mind and decides to tap into the corpus of the fund. Well, it wouldn't be tapping into. So how they would explain it is we're going to invest it. You know, the permanent fund is there to be invested. So we're going to invest it in in this project uh, and it'll produce, you know, returns. It'll produce huge mo- amount of money for the for the state in terms of the dollars that we'll get back on. Not going to happen. Uh, so <laughs> but but I, somebody's going to say that somewhere along the way that, that, that we'll just invest the money in the in the in the bullet line. We'll get our money back by by the tolls that are the bullet line or the big line will get it back by the tolls that are going to be charged. But this is a place, this is a place where we finally ought to draw the line and say economics prevail. What's yeah. the, what's the lowest cost way of, uh, of continuing to meet the energy needs of, uh, of South central. And it's not only gas, it's not only NSTAR, but it's also the gas fired electric generation plants that we have. So right. part of, part of the solution may be more, uh, more more wind wind turbines, maybe more you know solar panels, maybe more tidal tidal energy to reduce the electricity demand, the electric demand on uh, on gas. Well, that's part of that article that talks about in the Alaska Public. The article that uh, that talks a lot about this is that they're looking more and more at these renewables, which of course has its own conversation that you know that needs to be required because it can't always provide. I mean, we've seen that with the wind and everything else. Uh, uh, projects around the state. They can't always provide a re- reliable source of energy. Gas is still, outside of nuclear, the best, you know, the least worst form of energy production. And so we need to do something. I mean, that that I think any of the renewables is going to be nothing more than a stopgap or maybe a feel-good measure. And the investment of that kind of is- infrastructure is still huge for that yep. kind of stuff. Yep. And we need to look at the economics of that. But we ought to find, I mean, here, here's the point. Instead of just rushing out and saying like Parnell did in 2013, or, or as some people are going to say now, no, we're not going to import gas, period. End of statement. You know, we're going to use Alaska gas, wherever it comes from. Instead of making that, we ought to continue to, to do these economic analyses and figure out what the lowest cost way uh, is for, uh, uh, for South Central to, uh, to have those supplies. And, and, yeah. and let the economics prevail as opposed to the the politics, uh, uh, prevail. It's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, this is, a uh, again, another full conversation that we could have here in the future. Um, but, uh, definitely, definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting discussion. Brad Keithley, thank you so much for, uh, thanks for coming on as always. It's good stuff. I hope you enjoy yourself while you're there. I will. Michael, thanks uh, as always for having me. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you being part of it today. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.